You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello, everyone. And welcome to History of the Great War, episode 71. This week, a big thank you goes out to Matthew and Adam, who have chosen to support the show on Patreon, where they now have access to special members-only episodes, including part two of our examination of British cavalry before and during the war that we'll be releasing here in just a few days. I would also like to thank Lars for his donation through PayPal. And finally... I would like to send a giant thank you out to Chell, whose name I'm hoping I'm pronouncing correctly, because Chell is from Norway, and he sent me an epic Facebook message detailing the situation in the neutral country of Norway during the war. I hope to do a Patreon episode on the various countries of Europe who remained neutral during the war here pretty soon, and Norway definitely just got added to that list. Last week, the Germans failed in their attacks on the West Bank at Verdun in March 1916. And April would mark the beginning of what I'm calling the Long Grind, by which I mean a series of attacks and counterattacks against the same targets for the next several months. This would begin with an attack by the Germans on both banks of the river in April, although we will not spend the entire episode on this attack. The last half of this episode will look at what it was like for the troops at the front while they were fighting at Verdun. This life settled into something of a routine after the turmoil of the first few months of the attack. There was a reason that their experiences at Verdun were burned into the memories of the soldiers who served there, and part of this horror would come in tandem with the rise in temperatures that started in the spring and would move into the summer. One thing that you might notice for the rest of the Verdun episodes is that we will begin skipping ahead in time far more than in the last five episodes. And in the next five episodes, we will rapidly move until Verdun reaches its conclusion at the end of 1916. So just be prepared for some larger than normal time jumps. By the beginning of April, the French had suffered somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 casualties during the course of the actions at Verdun. Critically, though, the Germans thought they had suffered 200,000, which is obviously a very different number, and this caused the Germans to continue to believe that they were winning the trades of men during the battles. At the end of March, the 5th Army asked for more troops, using the 200,000 number and their belief that the French must be close to exhaustion as the justification for their request. The goal with these new troops was something that had not been done up to this point. Instead of small, limited attacks on one bank with the support of the other bank, like they had done in March, this would be an all-out attack along the entire front. The full 20 miles of the front would be in action simultaneously to try and just completely overwhelm the French defenders. On the east bank, the goal would be further advancement towards the forts, and on the west bank, the goal was, of course, La More Home. Falkenhayn would agree to send the 5th Army the troops they requested, but these troops came with a message. Quote, the assumption that we are in a position to relieve the worn-out units with fresh, high-quality units at any time, and that we are able to provide a continuous replacement of materiel and munitions, is false. He was clear that this was not something that could continue indefinitely. The attack would begin on April the 9th, and surprisingly, it would last for just four days. On the West Bank on April the 9th, there would be five German divisions attacking into just three French divisions, and both Cote 304 and Morholm would be attacked simultaneously. Along the entire front, the bombardments would utilize seven trainloads of ammunition, which overall meant that it was the largest bombardment since February the 21st. When the attack began, as the script for attacks often does, the Germans made some initial progress, moving forward all the way to the initial crest of the ridge. Unfortunately, when the Germans reached at this crest, which they thought was as high as they needed to go, it soon became apparent that there was another summit, 100 feet higher, and that was still in French hands. So over the course of the entire battle, these two summits would bounce back and forth between German and French control 
as both sides would launch counterattack after counterattack in an attempt to push the other side off. Every time one side was able to take it, their troops were generally so exhausted that they were almost instantly pushed back, and this just continued on and on. One French officer of the 146th Regiment would spend the entire battle, all four days, on more home. He would somehow survive all of this action, and when he moved back behind the front, he would take the time to write and reflect on his experience. Quote, I have returned from the toughest trial I have ever seen. Four days and four nights. Ninety-six hours. The last two days soaked in icy mud. Under terrible bombardment, without any shelter other than the narrowness of the trench, which even seemed to be too wide. Not a hole, not a dugout. Nothing. Nothing. The Bosch did not just attack, naturally. That would have been stupid. It was much more convenient to carry a fine firing exercise on our backs. Result? I arrived there with 175 men. I returned with 34, several half-mad. A French chaplain who was also near the front during a fighting would write, quote, One must have lived through these horrors in order to get an idea of it. It seems as though we are living under a steam hammer. You receive something like a blow in the hollow of the stomach. But what a blow. Every explosion knocks us to the ground. After a few hours, one becomes somewhat dumbfounded. End quote. While this action was happening on the West Bank, on the East Bank, the attacks went forward as well. Here, the French resistance was much greater than what was found on more home, and the Germans accomplished pretty much nothing in all of their attacks. After the first four days of the attack, the Germans were not ready to stop and prepared to continue on the 13th of April, but then something happened. It began to rain. It would rain and rain and rain and rain and rain for the next 12 days. At first, the fighting continued, even with the rain, mostly as an artillery duel, while the infantry slowly continued to inch forward in the mud. But it soon got to the point where it could not be continued at all. Everything just got bogged down in the mud. Ammunition could not get to the guns. Food could not get to the front. Men just could not go forward. Eventually, all operations had to be suspended until the weather got better. And with all of the raining during the next two weeks, it would be May before the action would get started again. By the start of the April offensives... The Germans had suffered something like 85,000 casualties, compared to 100,000 for the French. By the time the April attacks were over, the German number was up over 120,000. This was a gigantic jump, and it was even worse when you consider that the French total casualties went up to just 133,000, so that gap closed quite a bit. And while this was not a great situation, there was one good thing to come out of the April attacks— La Mort Home was finally in German hands. It was a task that they had started back in March, but it was now done. Now there were new obstacles in front of them. First of all, Cote 304 was still untaken, and then there were more French positions behind La Mort Homme. The question whether it was wise to continue the attacks was getting asked more and more among German commanders at this point. They were just overall concerned that continuing was not the right move as there was some evidence that casualties were now roughly equal or maybe even in the French benefit. The problem was that if the Germans did not keep attacking, they would have to retreat. They were just too exposed in their current positions. One of the most vocal commanders was on the East Bank, General von Mudra. He began expressing his doubts in April, and he would say, quote, the attacking infantry is exposed to continuous fire from heavy and field artillery, at times coming from the flanks, at times from the rear. The rearward communications, the rest positions, and even the reserves are similarly exposed to enemy fire of all calibers. End quote. There was, of course, a disagreement about precisely what the plan should be, who should attack with what strength, and where maybe tactical withdrawals should happen. The only thing everybody could agree on was that they could not remain where they were. Falkenhayn agreed with the decision that the German troops couldn't stop, but he thought the attack should continue, and Nobelsdorf continued to agree with Falkenhayn in this regard, to the point where he would replace General von Mudra, whose mood continued towards pessimism as time wore on. 
Here was another moment where the Germans could have called off the attacks at Verdun, but they did not. It was all based on the belief that the French had to be suffering worse than the Germans, which was now not necessarily true. It was pretty close to even. I know that I've been really harping on this fact the last few episodes, and it is not just a German problem in 1916. You will hear me discuss it on the other side when we get to the Somme, this mistaken belief that the other side is having it worse and that you must continue because the next attack could be the one. There was one person on the German side that was starting to heavily waver in his belief in the attack, and that person was the commander of the 5th Army, the Crown Prince. On April the 21st, the Crown Prince would write, quote, I was now convinced, after the stubborn to-and-fro contest for every foot of ground which had continued throughout the whole of April, that although we had more than once changed methods of attacks, a decisive success at Verdun could only be assured at the price of heavy sacrifices, out of all proportion with the desired gains. I naturally came to the conclusion that only the, with the greatest reluctance it was no easy matter for me, the responsible commander, to abandon my dreams of hopes and victory. End quote. In his memoirs, he would write that around this time it began, he began to see Verdun as the mill on the muse that ground men to powder, the hearts as well as the bodies of our soldiers. You may be wondering why he did not have more power as, you know, the crown prince and as an army commander. As I mentioned several episodes ago, though, the crown prince was not a military man by occupation. Instead, he was put at the head of the army in 1914 because he was a crown prince. He was given Nobelsdorf as his chief of staff with expressed ex- instructions from the Kaiser that he should do whatever Nobelsdorf said. At Verdun, that meant that he would publicly support the continuation of the attacks at Verdun, even if he no longer believed in them. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. While these conversations were happening on the German side, there were also changes on the French side in March and April. First was a change at the top, with Joseph Gallini, the hero of the Marne and current war minister, dying on March the 27th after being severely ill for several months. In 1921, he would be posthumously marshal, made Marshal of France for his contributions during the war and before. He would be replaced by General Roquet, who, would, who was brought into the office on March the 16th. Joffre was consulted before he was appointed to make sure that they could get along, and Joffre approved Roquet. Almost instantly, Roquet was put under pressure to curtail Joffre's power and to investigate his conduct of the war, this pressure coming from the rest of the government, basically. And just a week after he was appointed as war minister, he requested that Joffre remove generals Dubail and Langle de Carri from their commands. The two men were chosen to take the blame for all of the French failures of the last year of the war. Joffre would at first resist this request, just on the general principle of not wanting the government to have any power over military affairs. But he would eventually bow to the pressure and relieve the two generals. While the government was not thrilled with the conduct of many of the French generals, Joffre had one general who was constantly causing him consternation— 
tan. After the successful defense of the April attack, Patan would begin to use the phrase that would show up on French propaganda and recruitment posters for the rest of the war. Courage on Leora, which means, I, I hope, courage will get them. This was not what was causing problems for Joffre, but instead Patan's rotation system that he insisted on using. It was a godsend for the men at the front, but it was causing problems for Joffre and his wish to continue with the attacks in other areas of the front. He was also strongly pushing Patan to launch a huge counterattack against the Germans, and he believed that Patan already had enough troops to execute this attack. He didn't need any more, even though Patan insisted that he only had enough to barely man the lines. On April 1st, Joffre would write to Patan that the counterattack should be launched immediately because, quote, this is the only way you can impose your will on the enemy, maintain the high morale of the troops, and close with success the final part of the operation that the enemy began at Verdun, end quote. A week later, he would again urge Patan to attack by telling him to launch, quote, a vigorous and powerful offensive to be executed with only the briefest delay, end quote. Patan would almost completely ignore all of these suggestions from Joffre, and this did not make Joffre even remotely happy, but he was in a bind, because he could not remove Patan. Patan was already a national hero, and he had been attached to the action at Verdun in the public opinion. So dismissing him, or moving him to another part of the front, would be extremely unpopular, and might have had some drastic ramifications back home. The dismissal of General Langle de Cadi gave Joffre an opportunity, though. You see, since Joffre could not remove Patan, and he couldn't move him somewhere else, he took the one action that he could achieve, and nobody could possibly complain about. He would promote him to the commander of the Third Army Group, previously commanded by General Langle de Cadi. Patan would no longer have direct command over the action at Verdun, and would instead be given command over an entire area of the front that just so happened to include Verdun. In his place, Joffre placed General Robert Nivelle, who was rapidly rising through the ranks of the French command over the course of 1915, and who had arrived at Verdun in April. Neville was an artillery commander by trade, and he was also very well-spoken, including a mastery of English, which meant that he was well-connected in Paris. The best part about Neville, in Joffre's mind, was that he wanted to attack even more often than Joffre did, and when he arrived at Verdun, he way quickly made his mark. He would continually order the French under his command to attack, and attack under any circumstances. He would also make changes to the rotation system that Joffre hated so much, and now French troops would spend far longer at Verdun. We will discuss Neville's changes in more depth next week, but his primary role in April was to move Patan out of the picture. But Patan would not be completely denied his influence, and he would propose that if the French were going to attack their objectives, they should be limited attacks with limited objectives backed up by strong artillery. This would be the hallmark of Patan's suggestions and methods for the rest of the war, and Neville would have absolutely none of it. And that is where we will leave the situation at Verdun for this week. And I think the best way forward is to spend the rest of the episode talking about what it was like to actually be a soldier at Verdun. This is a topic I have spread over several of the next episodes, but today we will talk about what it was like to approach Verdun for the reinforcements on their way to the front, and then discuss a bit about what it was like to live in the front line. Over the coming episodes, we will continue to touch on these topics, such as food and medicine and a couple others that I have lined up. Life at Verdun and the hell of it all began well before the troops even arrived at the front lines. Many soldiers say that the worst part was the foreboding sense of doom as they marched up to the front. The first sound that the troops would hear were the guns, constantly firing off in the distance. You could hear them for miles and miles behind the front. The next thing that they would have encountered was the refuse of battle. Lieutenant George Gotti would have this to say about it, quote, First came the skeletons of companies, occasionally led by a wounded officer, leading on a stick. All marched or rather advanced in small groups, 
zigzagging as if intoxicated. It was hard to tell the color of their faces from that of their tunics. Mud had covered everything, dried off, and then another layer had been reapplied. They said nothing. They had even lost the strength to complain. End quote. What Gaudi is describing is just the men that were able to move themselves back off the line, and does not even include the wounded and the dead being evacuated. As the soldiers got closer to the front, a fog of smoke that was all pervasive during most of the battle began to make its presence known, giving everything a gray and nightmarish quality. Once the soldiers were close to behind the line, they then prepared for the slow and difficult movement up to the reserve trenches and then to the front line. Future president of France, René Coty, was one of the men moving into the line during the fighting. Quote, Verdun means, first of all, the nocturnal climb of men bent beneath the weight of pack and munitions stumbling in the shell holes. Now, on all of the World War I battlefields, the first thing to be obliterated seems to have been any form of navigational aids in the form of signs or landmarks. This meant that the troops would sometimes wander around for hours and hours trying to find their way to their destination, all while weighed down with supplies. Sometimes the men would just get completely lost and not even arrive at the part of the line that they were supposed to, and it was only too often that they would spend so much time wandering, generally under the fire of artillery, that they would arrive at the line with far fewer numbers than what they started with. Now, those men who did arrive at the front were met with a special kind of horror. Here is Alistair Horn from The Price of Glory. Quote, Most Europeans alive today can conjure up some picture of existence in the trenches. But even to those who actually experienced it, the intervening years have mercifully softened the full memory of its miseries. Modern imagination quails the thought of human beings living month after month like rodents beneath the earth never completely dry, never free of evil-smelling mud, and never free from lice, except for maybe brief periods following a spell out of the line. End quote. Now, one feature of the Gallipoli battle that we discussed last year was what happened to all of the dead bodies between the lines when it began to get warmer during the summer, and the men at Verdun experienced the same problem. It was simply impossible to bury all the dead. And even when they couldn't get buried, it didn't mean that they stayed buried. One man would write in a letter home that the shell rips open and disinter the dead and send them past your face in shreds. And then the warmth of spring and summer came and the situation went from horror to something that I don't think I have the words to properly describe. By night, the men would labor to do whatever they could to improve their positions. They would usually just dig deeper, sometimes encountering dead bodies, sometimes not. In the end, it didn't matter, though, because when the day came, the accurate shelling would begin anew, generally destroying any improvements that had been made the night before. This cycle would continue for weeks and months at a time, even if it wasn't the same troops involved. One of the interesting features of the Verdun battle, and and I mean, this happened on other parts of the front during quieter times, but with how much action at Verdun, it's somewhat interesting is that a unit could be in the trenches for their entire tour of duty in the area and not see a single enemy. All they would see was the artillery shells falling on them day after day. Once the unit was sufficiently weakened, another would be brought up to take its place. This sounds really silly. Sending one unit up to just get chewed up by artillery, then then to only send in another. And then they get chewed up and you send in another, and it just, you know, if you're thinking this is silly and wasteful, you're not wrong. However, the French could not move troops out of the front line, especially in the most critical areas of the front, where the loss of 100 meters could cause the entire French position along the front to collapse, just due to the geography. For the Germans, they were constantly moving infantry up to the attack, and if they lost any of their hard-earned gains to a French counterattack because the front wasn't manned enough, then they would just have to take it back all over again, and how many guys died to take over that line that we just got? So both sides kept pushing strength up to the front, and the meat grinder continued to churn. This created a dread shared among all of the infantry over what the artillery could do to a man. It could just remove a man from existence, which created cases of shell shock and other neurological problems at the front. And there's also a thing where, you know, artillery is really bad when you're thinking about it as a person. Like, physically, artillery does horrible things to the human body. 
It's not just about being completely blown up, but instead the way that it injures you. Bullets leave nice, clean, in-and-out holes most of the time, but shells break, break into awkwardly shaped fragments that would crash into the soft human body, bodies like a truck hitting a small car. Another psychological condition caused by the artillery was just suffocating iso- isolation and loneliness. The artillery prevented any good connections with the rear and the flanks, even at the best of times. During an attack, units could find themselves completely cut off from everybody around them, and a handful of men might find themselves holding a hundred meters of trench all by themselves for days on end, with no contact with the outside world. The only way to try and even connect with other units was through runners, but this was often just a death sentence. During one attack, a regiment on Morhome would lose 21 runners in three hours. But some form of communication had to be kept between the front, and so the runners just kept on running. General Creighton, who would write that, quote, Many complain of the anguish a troop feels when it believes itself abandoned by the rear, leading sometimes to a general depression that can end up paralyzing all action. There was also a larger isolation felt by the troops at Verdun. And this seems to be more present in the German army, where there is this inability to identify with troops who had not been at Verdun, even if they'd been fighting somewhere else. Here's Horn again on this matter, quote, After a spell in the line, men felt as if they belonged to some exclusive monastic order whose grim rites were simply beyond the comprehension of the layman in the rear, end quote. Even with all of these problems and the difficulty of living at the front, there were remarkably few men who would revolt or refuse to go into the line. Some of the closest you get are when troops found other ways to complain about their conditions, but those will be discussed as part of a story on another episode. Next week, we arrive at one of the great stories of Verdun, the heroic defense of Fort Vaux by the French forces, as our chronicle rolls through May and into June, and finally reaches the halfway point of the Battle of Verdun. <laughs>